seven deadly sins in your PPC account and how to fix them. We're excited to have you here and to get started. My name's Callie and I just want to get some of the logistics out of the way so we can get straight to the fun. First, um, following our presentation today, you'll receive an email with the recording and the slides for you to review or share with colleagues and do whatever you wish with them. Um, we'll also have a dedicated time for Q&A following the presentation, so be sure to submit your questions throughout. Don't be shy, um, we're here to help you. Now for those of you who are not familiar with WordStream, we are a search marketing software provider with free and paid tools to help you easily grow your AdWords and Bing campaigns. So if you're looking to master paid search, definitely check out wordstream.com slash learn. Now we encourage you to be social today, so join in, in the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag PPCSIN or at WordStream and definitely follow both of our presenters today, Aaron and Marco. Now to meet our presenters, first up, um, which is really exciting, recently both of them were named to the top 25 most influential PPC experts by PPC Hero, so big congrats to both of them. Um, Margo is a regular contributor to our search engine journal excuse me, and social media today and our blog. You can definitely check her out there. Um, when she isn't working, she's running, eating ice cream, and spending time with her adorable nephew. And she was a fun fact about her, she was a former windsurfer instructor. Next we have Erin. Erin um, has specialized in paid search for over four years and is also a frequent contributor, contributor to industry publications, our blogs, and both of them will be speaking at PubCon in October, so if you're there, be sure to check them out. And in her free time, you can find her hula hooping, vacationing in the Caribbean, or binging on reality TV. And a fun fact about Erin, in a past lifetime, she was a former competitive piano player. Now I'm going to pass it right over to these ladies to get started. Hey, everyone. I'm Margo. And I'm Erin. Uh, we're really looking forward to sharing our seven deadly sins with you guys. Um, and Margo is going to get off, kick it off with gluttony. All right. So let's dive right into gluttony. Uh, for those of you who know Desperate or Housewives <laughs> of New York City, there's a funny image for you. <laughs> Aaron and I were laughing over Ramona the other day. Uh, so the first one is all about kind of overconsumption. Um, so what I really wanted to talk about here is your, if your account is overstuffed and disorganized, this is a huge sin for so many reasons. Um, but first, let's dive right into an actual account. This account shows an example where the ad groups are just way too large. You can see there's three ad groups that I'm, I'm pointing to there that have way over 100 keywords in each ad group. It's kind of crazy. Uh, this is a huge sin in PPC and something you never want to do. You can see this account is just totally overstuffed with keywords. And the funny thing is when I, when I went through this account and did some analysis, I noticed that all, almost all of the keywords in this account have zero impressions. So basically, it's just kind of a, a, a waste of space in your account. It's going to make management so much more difficult, and you're going to be spreading your budget probably too thin across keywords that are not as high of a priority to your business. And some other uh, questions that I wanted to ask you guys is, do you have a lot of ad groups that have over 30 keywords? Um, so like I just said, this is a huge sin because you're spreading your budget way too thin. Thin. Uh, Google AdWords actually suggests to have no more than 20 to 30 keywords in each ad group. And in my opinion, that's actually even a little much. So really, like less is more. You want to focus your budget on the keywords that are most important to that ad group, um, you know, to your business, to what your goals are. Another question I have is, do you have a massive amount of ad groups or campaigns in your account? Uh, so this is not always a bad thing, and it really depends on the industry that you're in. If you're you know, a huge retailer uh, with a global presence and you have tons of campaigns and ad groups because you sell so many products, you have a huge budget, sometimes this will make sense. Uh, you know, if you're a B2B company that only has two products that you sell and your market's a lot smaller, you shouldn't have you know, campaigns and ad groups stuff in your account. So it really depends on the business. but. Ultimately, you really want to prioritize your paid search account to focus on the campaigns and ad groups that are really going to help you achieve your goals and reach your KPIs, uh, which are your key performance indicators. And the last question I have is, are you not sure why your account is structured the way it is? So this can happen often if you, perhaps you inherited an account, you 
joined the company recently, you're taking over their AdWords, or maybe you know you you outsource for a while and you're just taking over the account, and the structure just doesn't really make sense to you. If it doesn't make sense to you, this is probably not not a good thing. Uh, and what you're probably going to want to do is actually restructure your account. So the structure of your AdWords account is basically broken down into five different levels. So you have your actual account, then you're going to have campaigns, which are basically a general theme. Uh, usually I decide how to structure my account campaign based on budgets. Uh, so for example, let's say I sell lots of different products. I sell tennis rackets and you know, tennis shoes and t-shirts. And you know, my t-shirts don't really sell that well online, but my tennis rackets are my main seller. I would, I would want to have a different campaign for my tennis rackets and a different campaign for my t-shirts and have a higher budget for that campaign. Um, then under that campaign, I'm going to have subcategories. So perhaps, you know, Wilson tennis rackets and focusing on different brands. Uh, maybe I want tennis racket for women, um, beginners tennis rackets. So there's all different ways you can kind of choose your ad groups and then you're going to have tightly themed keywords and ad text and landing pages around those keywords. Um, I know this is all a little bit complicated and there's a lot of different ways to structure your AdWords account. So Callie's actually going to send out a link to a blog post on some ways to, to structure your AdWords account to kind of decide which, which works best for your business. Another tip that I have is, like we said earlier, if you have so many keywords in your account, you need to get rid of the ones that are not getting impressions. So delete the junk, get rid of these keywords. You can see this study done by our founder, Larry Kim, here. He found that only 1.2% of the keywords in this study were generating impressions. And some of those were only generating one impression. So you want to make sure to get rid of all of the other keywords, the 99% of keywords that are clogging up your account. Just get rid of them. There's no need to have them in there. You're going to be much more efficient if you have a well-structured account. And lastly, Utilize tools. Um, so here are actually some tools that we have in WordStream. There's a lot in the marketplace, but here are some that are really helpful that I enjoy using for, for some of my clients. The first one is the split ad groups tool. So this takes those really large ad groups that we looked at the beginning and it splits them up into relevant, uh, you know, semantically related, kind of splits the keywords up to semantically related relevant ad groups for you. It does a lot of that manual work for you but also gives you the control to you know, change things around. We also have a campaign and an ad group builder if you need some help you know, restructuring or building out your account from scratch. All right, I'm going to pass it on to Erin for our next in greed. All right, guys. So this one is inspired by uh, Lil Wayne, who uh, has a saying, too much money ain't enough money. This is not a good motto to live by when it comes to PBC. Um, I think a lot of our clients, or I know from experience, that a lot of our clients are using broad match. And this is one of the worst PBC sins that you can commit. The reason being, this is like, like amateur hour. You should never be using broad match on all of your keywords. It's a great way to waste a ton of your PPC budget and get a ton of your relevant impressions and clicks. So let's take a look at it. Um, when I see my clients, have account, accounts that are all set to broad match, it makes me crawl under my desk and like want to drink a bottle. Um, it is really, really frustrating. So let's dial back and think about how broad match actually works. So I, I pulled Google's definition and I thought this was pretty interesting. So broad match lets a keyword trigger your ad to show when someone searches for that phrase. Similar phrases singular or plural forms of that phrase, misspelling, synonyms, stemmings, <laughs> related searches, and, quote, other relevant variations. To me, that sounds like everything but the kitchen sink. Like, that is literally everything you could possibly show for. So when you think about it, you know, a lot of times you choose your keywords very, very carefully. You're very cognizant about what you're using. And in the long run, broad match is so, so broad that all of your hard work goes to waste because you are connecting to people's searches of similar phrases, synonyms, stemmings. It just really gets very, very broad and oftentimes unrelated to what you're actually selling. 
So here's an example of a client that, that really, really got hit hard by this. So I recommended that she create an ad group specifically for chocolate cake. She went in and she did her due, due diligence, found all these great chocolate cake related keywords. She set them up and she sent it to me to review and I immediately noticed that she set every single one too broad. Now in her mind, she was like, okay, I'm bidding on all these chocolate cake related words. I'm going to show up when somebody looks for chocolate cakes. But in my mind, what I see is, well, she's bidding on cakes on a broad match, so she could show up for somebody looking for crab cakes. She was in Baltimore, so like likelihood of this happening was high. She's bidding on German chocolate cakes on a broad match. So anybody looking for Oktoberfest, German Oktoberfest, boom, they could see her ad. Dark chocolate. Connects with dark chocolate candy bar. Wedding cakes connects with wedding gowns. You guys get where I'm going here, right? Like all of these people who are looking for vastly different things could be exposed to my client's ad that was very, very specific to wedding cakes just because her targeting was off. So this is super dangerous and the likelihood of her getting impressions on these, high. The likelihood of getting clicks or actually relevant traffic to convert, very low. My recommendation here is get into your account and explore different match types. I won't go into the nitty gritty. We have tons of resources on our blog explaining how the different match types work. But I did want to highlight this idea that um, as you go through your match types, certain ones are more restrictive. Now, yes, they're going to have lesser reach. You're not going to be able to reach as many people. But you are going to be able to reach more relevant people by using these tighter match types. And a great starting match type, in my mind, is broad match, uh, modified broad match. This is awesome because, and, and if you guys are familiar with it, it's when you have those little teeny tiny plus signs in front of each word within your keyword. What that plus sign tells Google is that every word that has a plus sign must appear within the search query. Right? So you still get the benefit of having you know, this, this broad reach but you're ensuring that it's not getting too broad and Google isn't taking too many liberties. So I definitely recommend, if you're not familiar with it, get into Google and understand Modified Broad Match. Another thing I'd like for clients to think about is this concept of a tiered bidding strategy. Now this is a little bit advanced, so I'll warn you guys ahead of time if you're just starting out. This may not make sense at first. Um, but this is the concept of bidding on the same keyword multiple variations of it, each of them should be on a different match type. So yes, the same keyword may appear in your account multiple times. The key is it must have a different match type and a different bid. Now the goal here is to put your money on the most relevant, relevant traffic. So my thought process is I want to bid up for anything that's on an exact match. Oops, and it looks like, I'm so sorry, it looks like uh, the keywords are a little bit mixed up, so um, this column over here on the left, right here, it should actually be flipped. But essentially, if you have this keyword on an exact match, you should be bidding higher for it, specifically because they're going to get better traffic. And then you want to bid lower as you go down the line, meaning that broad match should have the lowest bid. Again, just putting your money on the more relevant searches. All right, so higher relevancy, higher bid. All right, I'll turn it over to Margo for RAS. All right, so let's move on to RAS, which is self-destructive behavior. So anyone who knows Orange is the New Black, there's a lot of that going on in that show. It's one of my favorite ones. Uh, it's pretty good. I've gotten to the first few seasons very quickly on Netflix, a little bit too quickly. <laughs> uh, but let's dive in. So. The main thing that I could think about that went along with RAF was, was clients that are not using negative keywords. And this actually ties in really nicely with Erin's last point about broad match. If you're not using negative keywords, so relevant searches. Um, so going back to her example of cakes, you don't want to be showing up for crab cakes. So if you are advertising you know, chocolate cakes in Baltimore, you want to make sure to have crab as an account level negative. Um, so this is so important, especially if you really need to get that larger reach and use some broad matches, uh, some modified broads and some phrases, you still want to have negative set up. 
Uh, the first thing that I wanted to go over here, though, is how do these negatives actually work? Uh, so this is, you know, it, it's a relatively simple concept uh, in theory. You know, you set a negative, it blocks a, a relevant ad from showing up. Um, but it's actually, it gets a little bit more complicated when you get into it because negatives can actually be applied at different levels within your account. So you want to think about it as account level negatives, campaign level negatives, and ad group level negatives. So let's go over the differences between those. Uh, if a keyword is just completely irrelevant to your business, you want to set that as an account level negative. So for example, going back to my tennis example from the beginning, uh, if you sell tennis rackets but you don't market to kids, you just don't have those, those smaller size tennis rackets, you'd want to make keywords like kids and children account level negatives, um, you know, perhaps girls and boys, to block those relevant searches. And for campaign level negatives, these are negatives that you want to block that are just irrelevant to that specific campaign. Uh, so an example for that is if you have a campaign that's all about tennis racket for beginners, you want to block keywords like advanced and intermediate from showing your tennis racket for beginner ad because that just wouldn't be relevant to what the person is searching for and they probably wouldn't click on your ad and buy your products. Uh, lastly, we have ad group level negatives. So this is one that people kind of dismiss sometimes. They think, you know, I'm just going to apply across the account. But there's a lot of scenarios when you actually want to set ad group level negatives just to ensure that you're showing the most relevant ad possible. Uh, so for an example, if you had a campaign all about different brands of tennis rackets, you're probably going to divide your ad groups down to each brand and then show them the relevant uh, branded tennis racket that they're looking for. You know, they have a brand loyalty to a specific brand, so they want to see that product. In this case, you'd want to make, for example, if you have a Wilson brand ad group, you want to make the other brands ad group level negatives so that you only show for Wilson branded tennis rackets. And you also should be using this tool we have in WordStream called Query Stream. It is my favorite tool. It is so useful. And it's something that you should be using at least on a weekly basis. What it does is it basically shows you what people are actually typing into Google to make your ads appear. So this is so powerful because you can really get a sense if you're bidding on the right keywords. And one of the main things that Query Stream does is it helps you find negatives that you might want to set up in your account. Um, so going through these queries, for instance, this is a, a client that it, they provide transportation to Cape Cod. Um, so I can see going through their query report that they're actually showing up for Cape Air, Rutland, Vermont. This is not relevant at all to this account. So likely they're going to want to make that keyword a negative. And what's really cool is you can actually make a negative right through query stream. So you can select the keyword and then see where that box is highlighted. You can set that query as a negative. Another thing you can always do uh, is hover over the keyword and it will highlight, highlight it in a red box and you can make an individual keyword a negative. So instead of making that whole query a negative, I can make just Rutland or just Vermont a negative across the account as well. All right, so now going back to Aaron for less. All right, this is kind of a tough one. I had trouble finding appropriate images uh, for less, but I thought this one was a good one. Um, so what are you lusting after in PBC? Probably position number one. Uh, it's pretty dreamy. A lot of people are pretty fixated on making it right up there to the top. However, this could be incredibly, incredibly detrimental to your, to your account. And the reason is when a lot of people are so focused on hitting number one, they're overbidding for that position. Overbidding is super, super dangerous. Aside from the fact that you're probably killing your budget very, very quickly, um, you could be negatively impacting your quality scores by overbidding. The reason being, um, if you are in position number one every time, Google is going to expect you to have super high click-through rates. And if you're not scoring those super high click-through rates, your quality score is going to be very low. 
Um, so essentially by inflating those bids, if you're not scoring really high click-through rates, so if you haven't optimized your ad to the best of your ability, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot and you'll even pay more because you have a crappy quality score and you're pushing for that top position. Um, you may also just be driving up your CPA too high, and by this I mean you're driving up your CPA so high that it no longer makes sense based on your margins for what you're selling. So um, don't be blinded by the idea of this, like, I have to hit number one without thinking of the implications that that has on your business and whether or not truly hitting that top spot is going to be um, beneficial enough. You're going to get enough of a return from that sale to make it your worthwhile. And then finally, you could be instigating a bidding war. Remember that you know, when you're setting these bids for this auction, they're impacting other people. They're impacting your competitors. And by bid, overbidding and inflating the bids for that particular keyword, you could really not only be hurting yourself, but be hurting other people, encouraging more competition, and just driving up your costs. So be smart about those initial bids. I think uh, the biggest issue when I see people overbidding is they go in like guns freaking blazing. They are like, I am going to spend as much as I can and hit the top from the get-go. Instead, be wise when you set those initial bids. Google gives us a lot, a lot, a lot of information that we can use to make smart choices. Um, you can see these screenshots from WordStream. We make it really easy for you guys to see what it looks like to get to the top of the page, and what it looks like to get on page one. Take that information and really manipulate your bids based on this. Maybe aim to hit position number three. If you're hitting position number three, then you can focus on your quality scores over time, maybe slowly make it up to position number one. You know, optimize first. Figure out what words you have to make it to the top for and which words you really don't. Um, so be smart when you start those initial bids. If you're overwhelmed by bidding, then don't feel that you have to do it yourself. Um, Google offers some automated bidding strategies that you can use. Uh, whether or not I endorse them, uh, I'm not a huge fan, to be honest. Uh, I've heard a lot of people having a lot of success with them. I've heard of people who don't have success with them. Um, certainly having Google as a kind of biased party involved is, is probably not the best place to go for uh, bidding help, but they do have automatic bidding solutions. You can also invest in a bid management platform. Uh, the picture I have here is of our bid management tool in WordStream. Essentially, we take a ton of information, we look at your position, your quality score, your performance, and help you understand on a weekly basis where you need to tweak those bids. With the mindset being, we're not going to make huge bidding changes and huge swings happen in your account. We're going to slowly, slowly tweak those bids, react to those bids, and help you make kind of gradually smart decisions in your account rather than going nuts and kind of aiming for position one from the get-go. Um, so definitely, if you feel uncomfortable running bidding on your own, turn to a bid management platform. There's a lot of good stuff out there, and it can really kind of prevent you from falling and pray to uh, lusting after position number one and, and, and spending too much on it. Okay, turning it back over to Margo. All right, so this next one is floss. Uh, I'm a huge friend fan, so I had to include at least one, one image from that. Uh, just Chandler relaxing, uh, not really caring about anything, so that's what we're going to talk about next. And this is what I'm wondering from you guys. Are you relying solely on Google suggestions to optimize? So this kind of goes along with Aaron's last of me. Google's not always the best person to listen to. Uh, just take a look at, at this example here. You might notice a common theme. These are all alerts uh, that I looked at in my, my client accounts that I found. Basically, every single one is suggesting for them to raise their bids or raise their budget. Uh, so why isn't this, you know, the best option always? There's many reasons, uh, but basically Google, you know, they're not really, it's not really a tool to, to give you kind of account-specific spe suggestions. Um, so what I recommend doing is actually using more of a tool, um, you know, maybe you don't have enough money, you, you need help, so you want other ways to optimize your account rather than just relying solely on these Google optimizations. 
I suggest using a, using a tool if you're looking to save money. Um, you know, find a tool out there that's going to help you, give you tailored suggestions that are specific to your account and also save you time. So clearly, if sloth is your sin, uh, maybe you're not necessarily lazy. Maybe you're just busy. A lot of us are you know, doing multiple jobs. You're not just doing paid search. You're also doing content and SEO um, and web development and whatever it is. You wear multiple hats. Uh, or maybe you work for an agency and you're juggling a lot of clients. Not all of us have the time to really go through our account and do that you know, 40 plus hours of analysis every week. It takes time to find those quick wins in your account. And if you're not giving your search account love, it's not going to do well. You have to you know, feed it to make it grow and to make it get you great results. Um, so this is actually one tool that I would definitely recommend. Uh, of course, I am a little bit biased, but the 20 minute work week is so effective. It cuts down the time you spend in your account drastically. Um, so you can, you know, a lot of my clients say, oh, I spent like 20 hours doing this and now I can do it in 20 minutes. It's so effective. Um, so I definitely recommend, you know, trying it out. It's, it's a tool that's worked for, for a lot of our clients here at WordStream. Um, and on to the next one. All right, the next one is Envy. Um, and this cracks me up. I don't know if any of you guys thought there was this, um, there was this uh, beauty pageant in Brazil where literally one of the girls got the crown and the other one immediately attacked her, ripped the crown off her head, and was totally envious of that win. So I thought it was a perfect fit for what happens a lot in PPC. And that's um, oftentimes I see that my clients have this crazy unhappy, unhealthy obsession with their competitor's account. And I liken it to being kind of the ex-girlfriend watching a new date. They're like totally competitive and jealous and just almost want to copy and be exactly like their competitor when really that, that's probably not the smartest route to go. And one of the biggest uh, situations I see this in is they're like obsessed over checking out their other competitors' accounts. So I can't tell you how many people have asked me, like, okay, how do I just like log into their account and see their keywords? That's not possible, first off. And, and it's not even something you should want to do. You should be bidding on the keywords that make the most sense for your particular business and your account. So this is something I see a lot. Um, a client will find out that their competitor as bidding on a term and automatically toss it into their account without really thinking whether or not it's a good fit for them. So I had a client who sold prom dresses. One of their competitors uh, was bidding on or seemed to be bidding on next day delivery prom dresses. So she decided she was going to bid on it. And it came to the account. Why? Because we got no conversions. Because the woman doesn't sell next day delivery prom dresses. I mean, it literally made no sense. We were bidding on it just to compete with this competitor, but then we couldn't stand our ground when people landed on our landing page. And what happened is people would get there, we'd be charged for the click, and then they turn right around and click on the competitor's ad, which is right after us, and they bought from the competitor because they actually offer next day delivery. So don't fall prey to this all, like, you know, focusing on what other people are doing. Think about what makes sense for you, your business, and your account. If you're looking about how you can kind of add new keywords and flesh out your account, as Margo said, the search query report is the best place to do it. Rather than obsessing over diving into someone else's account, look at your own search query report and see what you might be missing. These are all the search queries that are triggering your ads to show that you're not bidding on. So if you're getting conversions from these queries that you're not bidding on, add those to your account. Those are the words that are going to yield results for you. Um, and that's where you can really kind of scoop up extra conversions rather than just dealing up those keywords that maybe aren't proven to be a good fit for your account. Another instance of people being copycats is through ad text. Look at these two ads. Like this is unbelievable. They are literally almost exactly the same thing. Like they, they totally copied the first and second lines. And that's probably not the best route to go. 
Because in the end, your ads aren't going to stand out if they look the same as everybody else's. So what you need to be, do, be doing when you're crafting your ad text is really thinking about what makes your product or your service unique. Identify that unique selling point or unique selling proposition. Uh, there's a million and one ways to do this. Think about, you know, how your quality differs from others. Your pricing. Be it luxury or cheap. It's okay if your pricing is more expensive if you want to brand yourself as a luxury business. But you need to be um, explicit about that through your ad text. You know, maybe you have unparalleled service or um, you know, the best customer success team in the world. Count that. Maybe you're more convenient. Maybe you're closer by to everyone than your competitors. Or maybe you offer a faster uh, return than your competitors. Right? Think about all of those components and identify what it is that makes your product or service unique. Um, I put a couple examples here that I love. So JetBlue, huge fan of JetBlue. Um, and in their ad, they say, trays, knees, the two shall never meet. You know, touting the fact that they have more space in their seats than everyone else. Expedia says it pays to book with Expedia because they're so much cheaper <laughs> than everyone else. And Tom took a really cool approach with every footprint count in that they give away a pair of shoes to a child in need every time that you buy shoes. So that's a really unique thing about their product that makes consumers feel good, and that's something worth touting through your ad tax. Um, so think about what it is that makes you unique. And if you need help with this, we recently posted a blog post on the WordStream blog that dives in really deeply on helping people figure out their USP. So I definitely recommend reading that. Now once you've identified that USP, USP then get into your ads and promote it. Like, get in there and make that your big thing in your ad text. You don't have a lot of characters. You have like 95 characters to say your piece, and you're probably trying to include a call to action in there somewhere. So use line one, maybe a little bit of line two, to tout your unique selling proposition. That's your, your opportunity to sell yourself. And then make your ads pop by using extensions. I mean, if you look at these two ads, the, uh, the first one and the second one, I think it's really clear which one you would click on. I know which one I would click on. It's easily the first one. Even if it was below the Deja Vu catering, I'd click on cater to me. Why? Because my eyes went directly to that big, robust ad. It has these call-outs. It has a review, like a third party saying that they are good at what they do. It has additional links. Like there's everything that you can need provided to in this ad. And that's because they're using extensions. So extensions are awesome because you are able to provide additional information directly within your ad text. Don't cost anything additional. They're freaking easy to set up. They have, you know, you have minimal maintenance required to keep them up and running. And they allow your ad to cover more of the SERP. So you take up more real estate, making yourself way more visible to people out there. They also are proven to work really well. So on our accounts, we're seeing an average of about 30 plus percent more clicks on ads that use extensions. The options here, they're endless. And you need to pick what works best for your business. Be it site links, where you can provide additional links to different pages on your site, um, call out extensions. This is one of the newest ones. We're seeing great results here. Review extensions, where you feature a third-party reviewer. Call extensions, obviously very, very huge for mobile, local businesses. Call extensions are amazing. App extensions have also become hugely popular um, in the mobile market location extensions, like the list goes on. But there's so many different ad extensions, and the reason Google keeps giving us more of these is not just because they work for advertisers, but because users like them. They like having this additional information. Last thing here to make your ads stand out, you can also use these super, super specific um, ad customizers. 
So ad customizers are, in my opinion, the coolest thing to come out so far in 2015. They are like dynamic keyword insertion on crack. And the reason is because they allow you to have this really customized information in your ad text, oftentimes relating to the end of a sale or a dwindling product supply. So by including this little snippet of code, you can actually um, automatically create uh, like changes within your ads based on the number of products you have left, the amount of time left in your sale, and that gives people this sense of fear of missing out, this FOMO, where they're like, oh my god, there's only you know, four shoes left in my size, I need to buy it now. Um, so definitely helps you stand out from your competitors and encourages people to take the plunge and convert. And we're actually seeing in our accounts that as the sale ends, the quantity starts to diminish, conversion rates increase by up to three times as much. So this is huge and they're easy to set up. Um, and Marco actually, I think, wrote something in our blog the other day explaining some cool ways you can use these customizers. So I absolutely recommend checking them out. All right, and number seven is Pride. All right, so let's move on to our last sin for today, Pride. Uh, so this is a great one, just kind of having that inflated ego. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, so the, what, is, what Pride is typically, I identify people who have too much Pride in PPC, is people who are not tracking their progress, and they just assume they're doing really well. Uh, reality track, you know, you need to actually track your progress and do some reporting, um, you know, find which metrics are, are most informative to your business and keep an eye on those and report on them on a regular basis. This is super, super important. Um, the first thing you want to do is try to figure out how you're doing. So we have actually this free tool at WordStream. It's called the AdWords Performance Grader. Uh, if you just you know throw that in Google, it'll come right up, and you can actually grade your account and figure out how you're doing compared to other people in the industry. And we've graded you know billions billions of dollars in AdWords spend. So I definitely definitely recommend doing this because it's a great way to kind of figure out little areas in your account that you might not be doing well. You know, maybe you're wasting money. Maybe your quality scores are, are lower than you thought. Maybe your click through rates are lower than you thought. Whatever it is, it really helps kind of give you that reality check um, and you know your pride might go down a little bit in terms of PPC, but hopefully you'll be able to raise it, raise your confidence back up by making those improvements. Uh, one thing that I noticed, it's actually shocking to me, a lot of people are not tracking conversions. Uh, so this is a huge, huge PPC sin. Because if you're not tracking conversions, then how are you going to know if your if your efforts are effective? Um, you know, most people come up with a goal of getting more conversions through paid search. What, whether you define a conversion as you know a direct purchase on your website or a form fill out, there are so many ways you can define a conversion. Some people even just define it as someone coming to their homepage because they're looking for more branding. Um, whatever it is, make sure that you're tracking these important actions so you can understand if your paid search efforts are effective. So to set this up, it's so, so easy. You can actually set it up directly in WordStream if you are a WordStream customer. Uh, if not, you can set it up in AdWords as well. But basically what you'll do is you'll create a new conversion. You can title that conversion something to kind of make sense of it for yourself. And then it, you'll, it'll generate a code which you have to copy and paste and to the, between the body tags of the Thank Your Confirmation page after the person converts. Uh, I know this is a little bit confusing, so we do have a lot of material on our site to help support you. Uh, also, definitely, uh, you know, talk to your, if you have a webmaster, they can easily put your conversion code in for you. It's, it's pretty simple. Actually, to point out, um, anyone in here who is our customer, we, who is our customer, we actually started doing this on their behalf. So if you ever need help setting up your conversion tracking, reach out to your CS rep and we can get you all set up. You don't even have to dive in and learn all the kind of the dirty work behind it. Perfect. And another thing that you should be doing is tracking calls. So this is something that a lot of people aren't doing. Uh, and if calls are important to your business and they're a, a main driver or just a driver at all of conversions, you should definitely, definitely be tracking these in terms of your paid search efforts because 
you won't really be able to effectively evaluate how your campaigns are performing if you're not tracking calls. Uh, so this is something that's you know pretty easy to do. Basically what you do is you when someone goes to your landing page and they call from that phone number, you're going to be able to track that as um, whether it's a conversion or not, you know, based off of a number of things. So how long they were on the phone for. And you can specify that information. Then you can track it back to the actual keyword ad group campaign, where that call was, was driven from your AdWords account, so you know which keywords ad, ad groups campaigns are most effective. Um, so that's also a service that we offer here at WordStream. And our, like Aaron pointed out, our, we have an implementation specialist who can help you get set up with that. Yep. And lastly, like I said before, you want to be regularly reporting on your AdWords progress. So even if you're doing well one month, you, your account might you know, fall off the next month. You want to make sure that you're looking at your most important metrics on a, on a regular basis. If you can do it on a weekly basis, great. If not, at least be running a report on a monthly basis to understand how you're performing in terms of things like click-through rate, conversion rates. Um, different metrics are going to be important for different goals and businesses. But one thing we have here at WordStream is our success report. You can run this every month. It's going to give you a very beautiful display of how your account's performing and help you focus on you know, areas where you might need a little more love and areas where you're doing really well. Um, our agency clients tend to really love these reports too because they're very easy to, to set up um, with a click of a button and you can send them right off to your client. You can actually customize them a little bit as well. Uh, so definitely you know, don't make the, the PPC sin of not reporting and tracking your progress. This is so, so important. Great. Thank you both, Margo and Erin, for today's presentation. Um, before we get into our Q&A section, we do have a couple of free um, special offers for you guys today. So if you'd like to sit down with an AdWords consultant and learn more about how our call tracking and our reporting works, um, definitely let us know that and we can teach you how to manage your, your PPC account in 20 minutes a week. Or if you're looking to kind of learn more about the grader that Margot spoke about, um, our free tool, and learn how you're performing in AdWords and see what's going on there, then let us know that. Um, and finally, if you're all set and don't need any help with your PPC, then um, definitely let us know that as well. Now, ladies, to get to some questions, um, can you guys discuss, um, can you cover some best practices on how to remove keywords? Sure, definitely. Um, so one thing you can do is just take a look at the different metrics tied to your keywords. So you can actually sort by different columns. So the first thing I do is probably sort by you know, impressions. See which, key see which keywords haven't gotten any impressions over a certain period of time. Uh, maybe you've been running some keywords for you know, 60 days, let's say. They've gotten zero impressions. Get rid of those keywords. Those are the keywords that I would start off with. Uh, you can also sort by other metrics like you know, conversions. If you have keywords in your account that have been running for so long and they're not converting, uh, those might be worth pausing. They may not be, though. If they're getting you know, lots of clicks and they're still giving you traffic, it kind of depends on, on you know, uh, what's important to your business. But getting rid of keywords with you know, low impressions or that are generating irrelevant traffic to your site or are not converting, if that's very important to you, those are the ones that I would focus on getting rid of. And like I said, sorting by columns is going to help you to, to identify those keywords. Yeah, I'm right there with Margo. I, I kind of think of it as a cyclical thing. I think a lot of people uh, really emphasize the idea of adding keywords to their account and they forget to clean up. And then it just becomes a total nightmare because it's really hard to uh, organize their accounts, hard to make sure that they're kind of hitting all their bases. So I think of it as cyclical. I add new keywords, and then I assess those keywords. You know, I give them some time to generate some volume. I assess them. If they're great, I hang on to them. I optimize them. I, I keep working with them. If they have no search volume or are performing poorly um, and, and are beyond the point of optimization, I get rid of them. I know I'm going to add more in the future. So don't be afraid to get rid of keywords as long as they're not you know, yielding a ton of conversions or whatever for you. Great. Thanks, ladies. Now for the next question. What about broad match keywords that have high level of conversions on them? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so obviously, we don't want to get rid of anything that's working really well. Um, that said, 
this, these broad match keywords, even though they may have a high number of conversions, um, it's worth looking at your search query report to really get a, a sense for what terms they're matching to that are converting. Um, that way, you can start to pull those terms out and show you're bidding on them. They could be a longer tail keywords that may be cheaper for you. So you may be paying a good bit because they're on broad match. Maybe you have a higher bid. Maybe you can get something super cheap um, because it is kind of this lower search volume keyword. So look at your search query report to understand which of those terms matching to them are yielding conversions. And then you also may see a lot of crap that you're connecting with. And that's where this idea that Margot talked about, about adding negative keywords, is going to be crucial. Um, you may not elect to, to bid on other keywords or adjust that match shape ever, but if you're using negatives, you can really kind of ensure that you're bidding on it in a safe manner. Yeah, I completely agree with Erin. You don't just, if a keyword's doing really well on broad, don't pause it. We're not saying, you know, um, broad match is, like, Evil. don't use it. Yeah. yeah. We're just saying don't only use it because right. it can, like we said, give you a lot of those relevant queries. So as long as you're using it carefully and keeping track of your search query data, then you should be fine. Great. Now, Erin, I know you touched on kind of competitor keywords and whatnot, but can you kind of provide one or two tidbits to help with competitor clicks and click fraud? Ah, yes. I just heard a blog post on click fraud, actually. So click fraud is definitely a very real thing. I think a lot of us have probably hit it once or twice. Um, there's two types of click fraud out there. There's essentially publisher-based click fraud, where um, with the display network, the person whose site the ads are shown on is doing the click, the fraudulent clicking. <laughs> that evil clicking, and then um, the other type of click fraud is competitor-based click fraud, which is probably what most of us are more familiar with, um, where our competitors are trying to drive up our costs, kill our budgets uh, by clicking on our ads. The good news is Google does a pretty good job of weeding a lot of this out. They have a team dedicated to sniffing out click fraud. They have really, really advanced methods of identifying it. Um, they monitor IP addresses to ensure not a ton of clicks are coming in in a short period of time from a particular IP address. Um, but if you don't want to put all of your eggs kind of in the Google basket, you can certainly monitor it on your own. Um, I have a step-by-step -step process of doing that that I laid out in the blog post and a couple methods on how to identify that it is click fraud. If you do indeed recognize that you're a victim of click fraud, all you need to do is report it to Google. They'll launch an investigation to confirm that that is the case and um, hopefully pay you back for those invalid clicks. So uh, definitely recommend reading more into it, but there's a lot that you can do to prevent it. Cool. Now, next question. So we have um, someone on the line who has one ad group that is performing pretty well, but almost all the clicks are coming from one specific keyword. Is it okay to keep this ad group with just a keep? Uh, with just a couple, excuse me, keywords in it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is something that I touched on, you know, how Google suggests to have 20 to 30 keywords, so that's not always ne necessary. You can actually have way less keywords and really have an effective ad group. Uh, and it's not uncommon to see one keyword driving most of the clicks and conversions. That just means you have a, you know, VIP keyword. <laughs> so that's a great thing. Uh, what, I, what I do recommend is tiered bidding, like Erin talked about earlier. So if you have this great keyword, you might want to try it on other match types. So maybe that keyword's on modified broad, for instance. You might want to try bidding on that keyword on exact at a higher bid, and then at phrase at a bid in between the modified broad and in the exact. Uh, and then you can kind of test out you know, which match types are working best. Um, so that's a, a technique you can use. But I wouldn't be you know, afraid or, or upset that you have one keyword that's you know, doing the best in that ad group. It's fine to have ad groups with a smaller number of keywords in them. Great. Thanks, Margo. Can you suggest best practices using geographic keywords? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, honestly, this one really is dependent on how your website is set up, how um, kind of your account strategy. I definitely recommend getting specific with those geographic terms if that's something um, that you think is important to searchers. So particularly if you're a local business um, where you know people are going to be searching for things specifically in your area, utilize those location-based terms. Ensure that your landing pages and 
your landing pages match up with those ads, and you do indeed provide service in those areas. Um, anytime you're a local business, obviously you want to make sure you're utilizing things like location extensions to demonstrate that to people and show them how close you are to them. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, you can also like structure your account based on the locations that are most important to you. Okay. Uh, so like you might have, you might offer different classes in different locations, Boston, New York, London. Uh, have a campaign for each of those locations and make sure you're targeting the cities where you offer uh, or the areas around the cities where you offer those, those classes. Uh, so structure definitely plays a, a role into that, but all of Aaron's points are, are spot on. So that's a great question. Great. We have time for a few more questions. So someone feels as though they can catch a lot more qualified searches with fewer keywords, so they're interested in learning how to use Broad Modified. Cool. Um, broad Modified is, is it's really easy to utilize. Basically, you just add a plus sign uh, before each word in a keyword. Um, that said, I, I think it's, it's important to expand your keyword list and not to rely just on these broad and, and broad modified terms. So even if you are using modified broad, I still recommend keeping an eye on your search query report. I still recommend utilizing exact match keywords. Um, those, are, those are important like, nuances that you can manipulate to ensure that you're spending less on your PPC. So um, I wouldn't rely solely on, on modified broad, just like I wouldn't re rely solely on broad match. Each match shape has its place in your account. Um, and, and modified broad is a good place to start, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be utilizing or phrase particularly exact match on some occasions. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, no. Cover it. Okay. <laughs> now going back to um, the competitors and, and fraud and whatnot, um, how can we find our competitors' IP address? Oh, there are. I'm not exactly sure, but I know it's easy to find. There are websites where you can uh, look it up. I can, let me briefly check into that for you guys, and I'll have Callie send it out on the, uh, on the link. Perfect. Now, our last question um, is what, what, what click-through rate would you be happy with? Uh, that's a good question, but it's a little bit broad, so it really depends. Uh, every industry is different. So it really depends, you know, what industry you're in, what you're advertising, what type of keywords you're bidding on. So I really, I would never really give out a specific click-through rate to kind of rely on uh, as a standard. But there are some resources, like we have one post on, you know, um, average click-through rates for industries, uh, things of that nature. So you can check out um, different research, research that was done, but I wouldn't, um, you know, kind of, I wouldn't really give away a specific number, and it's very industry and business specific. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, definitely. I think like when you're looking at click-through rates, if you're not looking at your click-through rates in conjunction with your position on the SERP, then you can't accept that. You can't assess that click-through rate, right? It's going to be different. Google expects high click-through rates when you're in position one and two. It expects lower click-through rates when you're in position six or seven. But you may have a low a low position, uh, low click-through rate in that low position, but in comparison to the kind of uh, amount of eyeballs you're getting, it's pretty good in comparison to, you know, maybe what somebody else is getting in the first position. So you want to think of it in conjunction with that position and know that it's okay to have lower CTRs in those low positions. That's expected. Cool. Now, one last question, sorry. Um, how often do you usually change bids on keywords, especially in comparison to Google's suggest first page top position? Um, pretty regularly, I would say, actually, because the auction is always changing, and it changes with you know seasonality, days of the week. Uh, it changes really frequently. So I definitely recommend keeping a close eye on bids uh, and utilizing tools like Aaron talked about earlier to kind of help you with your bid management, because there are ebbs and flows to the auction. Uh, it's, it changes all the time. Like I said, there's new players on the game. Uh, there's, there's different competition. People have their ads paused or they come back, uh, whatever it is. So just keep an eye on that. And you want to be keeping an eye on things like average position, impression share, to make sure you're being you know, competitive enough to get the placements that you want. Perfect.
Well guys, that concludes today's webinar. I'd like to thank both Margot and Erin for joining me today and all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to sync up with us and learn more about all the seven deadly sins in your PPC account. Um, we look forward to seeing you at a fellow, uh, our next webinar and um, be sure to look out for our follow-up email. We'll be sure to send that out shortly. Thanks guys and have a great day.